On today's episode, I'm joined once again by global wine expert and senior lecturer at Cornell's Nolan School of Hotel Administration, Cheryl Stanley. Cheryl and I pop some corks today and look into the differences in appellations, designations, and geographical indications among wines from around the world. We're going to help you demystify and decode wine labels so that you can better understand what a sense of place means in wine appreciation. Yep, we're talking terroir today. And be sure to check out the episode notes for the details on eCornell's online certificate programs and courses on wine appreciation, of course, authored by my guest, Cheryl Stanley. Listeners, let's go on this wine journey together. Here's my conversation with Cheryl. Today, we are going to be talking about various wine appellations, designations, indications, all of this information that sometimes we encounter on wine bottles that either is completely mysterious to us Mm -hmm. or intimidating, kind of at the same time. What is this all about? Give us a framework for understanding here. So boils down to a sense of place. Okay. Telling you where the grapes are from. Now, Mm -hmm. there are certain places that have much more rules and regulations, but generally speaking, if we have to say about the world of wine, a designation of place is just where the grapes are from. And this is something that is particular. The the framework, the regulatory bodies are unique to countries, right? Correct. That's that's how this works. And it can go even unique to the specific area. So you can Mm -hmm. have a governing board of the area, which will write the rules and regulations associated with that area. What is the point? Uh, You know, you had mentioned that it's to inform us as the consumer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, obviously producers are involved on the other side to let us know where something comes from. Is there any other motivation to do this? We had talked before. Is this a guarantee of quality, for instance? You're going to love my answer, Chris. Okay. (laughs) It depends. On what? Well, it depends on, well, I should say quality always boils down to the producer. Mm -hmm. You could have a controlled and guaranteed wine from Italy, but Mm -hmm. one producer is going to be different than the next. Their vineyards, their sourcing is going to be different from another. So the place is going to give you a sense, but then the next step is you as a consumer has to do, have to do more research about the specific producer and their and their method of production if it's not completely dictated by the rules and regulations of that place. So let's take a case study. Let's look at France, for instance, right? Mm-hmm. So when we look at France, we see on bottles, we see Burgundy, Beaujolais, more specifically, then we'll get into like Chateauneuf de Pop, Chablis, Fleury, like we had last week. Mm-hmm. It goes all the way down to like one side of the river. Yes, <laughs> that, you know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. One vineyard X marks the spot gets a grand cru, yeah. whereas five feet down the lane, it's a named place, but it's not even classified. It's just a village. And what makes that difference? So a lot of these rules, and especially the designation of place in European countries, are hundreds of years old. These vineyards have been recognized, starting with the monks, even the vineyards in Portugal and and specifically the port area up in the Douro Valley were demarcated in the 1700s because they recognized certain vineyards were better than the other. Then as the regulations came about, specifically in the 1900s, you know, in France in 1933, then in 1935, you're looking at, okay, putting some rules and regulations associated with it. Now, what's the correlation between the geographical location and soil types, for instance, right? Or the amount of water, drainage, all of that kind of stuff sort of figures into this stuff? Or how does that work? It does, because if you're going all the way down to a single vineyard, Mm -hmm. that single vineyard, as you mentioned, is going to have different soil. So that soil can impact the flavor of the grapes, then transmits into the finished wine. So, Mm -hmm. yes, a wine from one vineyard could have a different flavor and aroma profile compared to a vineyard next door. So it it does take a lot of palate mileage when you get into these these single vineyards. But I think it's just understanding the difference and giving a consumer, giving someone confidence and like, oh, okay, I know where this place is. And there are restrictions sometimes prohibitively. We talked about the Bouvray scandal of 2014. Tell us about that. First of all, Vouvray, what are we talking about? What Vouvray, kind of wine? Well, Vouvray is a beautiful white wine producing area, and they produce sparkling wines as well in the Loire Valley of France. And they're known for their Chenin Blanc. And you had in 2014, the regulatory board of the Vouvray AOC came in and said, OK, if you want to use Vouvray on your label, which demands more money in the market, you have to grow the grapes, make the wine, and bottle the wine within the Vouvray AOC. There are a couple producers who had just built some new production facilities outside of the Vouvray AOC. 
So they were put in a little bit of a conundrum. Do I take my Chenin Blanc and ferment it and bottle it outside of the AOC and then have to declassify it so I can't make as much money? Or do I keep my winery, my production facilities within the AOC and be able to to bottle it as Vouvre? So then now you are carrying the cost of two wineries and not one. So we just covered France, Italy. How does how is it uh, Italy structured similarly or different? Italy is structured similarly. They have an extra step. They have the controlled and guaranteed, the DOCG level, which you'll see on the label. And that takes a tasting step. So, you know, you asked that question earlier about quality. So here you have that tasting step. If it doesn't meet the quality as designated by the tasting board of the area, that fruit or that wine will have to be declassified. And we see this in France and Italy as well. Certain areas maybe were at the regional level, the IGT or IGP level for the various countries. Protected geographic indication, but they've produced really, really good wine. And so the government is looking at actually elevating them up to an AOC or in Italy's case, a DOC. Germany. There's there's lots going on in Germany. There are lots of things going on in Germany. And it's it's an exciting time as an educator and as a lover of German wines, though I'm still trying to get my feet underneath the new classification sure. because it's for those of you that are familiar with with Burgundy, kind of what we were talking about having the classification go to the specific vineyard. That is something that we're seeing now at the national level, which historically you have the Verband Deutscher Pradikas Weinguter, the VDP, the producer classification who already had a structured pyramid of regional village and then the single vineyard classifications for Premier Fru and Grand Cru. But now we're seeing it on the national level as well. And this is due to wrap up. We were just talking a minute ago, 2025 or something like that. Yes, they'll have until 2025 to kind of figure out which vineyards are going to be good enough to be named at like the first crew level. But then you'll have the best vineyards as well. We've got a couple German wines to taste here. We do. What are we digging We into? do. So we have a regional Mosul. And that's something that many consumers are comfortable with. They see Mosul, they know it's a high quality wine producing area. This is a river valley. This is a river valley, a very, very curvy river valley. And when you see Mosul, great. You recognize the place, you know it's going to have high acidity, various sweetness levels depending on the wine. And this specific wine is the Zillikin. It's an estate Riesling. And this producer has vineyard sourcing primarily in the Tsar River. But they labeled it as Mosul because it's reflective of the general region. And then we're going to compare it, actually, to a single vineyard of VDP Grossalaga. And again, I mentioned that the VDP already has this classification structure of recognizing the best vineyards. And this is specifically from the Josef Hofer vineyard. But let's just kind of look at the wines. If we look at okay. the wines color-wise, there's... The Josef Hofer is just a little bit more intense in in color, mm -hmm. but both of them are, are fairly pale straw, yes. you know, nothing crazy in, in terms of differences. And then if we smell, both of them smell like Riesling, right? And that's, yeah. that's the great yeah. thing is even with these new classifications, Germany and, you know, even Austria in the future, they're going to label by variety. So you'll know as a consumer, okay, this is Riesling, I like Riesling, but it's the other terms on the labels that a village that you might not be familiar with or a vineyard that you might need to just get your phone out and Google. And it's OK. We talk about sugar levels mm -hmm. uh, at harvest, too, right? That's the the cabinet designation that's on there. The cabinet, yes, the Prati Cots vine. It's, okay. it's part of within the wine with special attributes. So cabinet is the the base level of ripeness within the Prati Cot. And then if a producer harvests, well, and this is what's also interesting with these new classifications. They are designating certain grape varieties in certain vineyards, as well as certain ripeness levels at harvest. Perfect. Let's taste. Okay. Oh, we forgot our spit cups today. Oh, we sure did. <laughs> Isn't this beautiful? Oh, man. I mean, it's just beautiful, bright acidity, yellow flowers, apples, peaches, gorgeous. This is a beautiful expression of the Mosul. It's a stunner. Mm -hmm. We're going to share the, uh, the names of each of these wines as we go through with the audience via chat. Just oh. letting you know, heads up for that audience. Beautiful. Then let's get to our VDP Grosslaga. VDP Grosslaga, this is the Josef Hofer again. This is a specific vineyard within the Mosul. Similar nose. Similar yeah. nose, right? Same the peaches, apricots, white flowers. 
still that beautiful Mosul Syrian acidity is gorgeous. This wine, they label as a fine air. So that means it's off dry. It has a little bit of residual sugar to it. But the acidity balance, it appears dry almost on the palate. It's hard to say what's the difference. What What is the difference between the Mosul versus the Yosipoffer? A little bit more intensity, Mm -hmm. intensity in color, intensity in in flavor and aromas. But both of these are beautiful wines. They really are. They're like a bouquet. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, as if you want to kind of play some fun games, do some fun events, you can get one producer and go up the pyramid with that producer and oh. try and even pick out what are the the slight nuances between the wines. I'm so glad you brought these two. Those are beautiful. Mm-hmm. Austria, similar deal with Germany is from a regulatory standpoint, right? Yes. What's going they, on there? they are, I should say, on a national level, you had some designations already. They're expanding it. Once you hit the DAC or the controlled Austrian districts, then you can go for regional, village, and a single vineyard. And just like the VDP in Germany, this that producer classification, there are producer classifications that have been recognizing special vineyards on labels for decades. What are some of the premier wines that come out of Austria? Do do Riesling similarly? They dry Riesling. Also, I mean, we can't Gruner Vetliner. Yes. Gruner Vetliner, beautiful. And and one thing is these Gruner Vetliners can age, especially they're not like the the crown cap under ten dollar type leader. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's these wines. You know, I have some in my cellar that are twenty five years old that just take on this creaminess, this intensity of flavor. But I know there are certain vineyards in certain vintages that mm-hmm. age better than others. Glad I asked. Okay, so let's talk about non European countries, old world versus new world. Breaking away from that type of terminology you mentioned recognizing that they're European and non-European and really highlighting that they're different, they have different laws and going away from new world and old world. Let's talk about the AVAs, the U.S. official Appalachian State of the American Viticultural Area is what we use here. How does this kind of play out? California, for example, let's use that as as a case study. And California is a perfect one because they produce 85 percent of the wine or approximately in the United States. It's the designation of place. Mm -hmm. But it does not dictate to the producer what grape variety you are allowed to grow, method of production, et cetera. You know, states have the right to create stricter labeling laws and the percentage of grapes that must be from that AVA or American Viticultural Area. But it's it's really telling us as a consumer, this is where the grapes are from. So when we see on a bottle, this is nothing, probably nothing to the audience, but we'll see things like Napa Valley, Sonoma Valley. And then now California is drawing, you know, drawing down even further. We've got something from, um, where's that right, California wine? Right, the Oak, Oak Knoll District where? Uh, within Napa Valley. So it's it's fun for the two wines that we selected for California. We actually did a North Coast AVA. And North Coast AVA is, is a very large area, but it's made up of parts of multiple counties. So Napa County, Sonoma County, Lake County, Mendocino County are the primary ones. And then we have a very, very small AVA in Napa Valley or with it. So it's kind of like concentric circles, the county down to Napa Valley and then the Oak Knoll District, which is north of Napa City. So it's fun where it's a southern AVA influenced by San Pablo Bay. But here you have North Coast, which also because it pulls the other AVA pulls from Sonoma County, you have influence of the Pacific Ocean. So how do those kind of compare against each other. And both of these are, uh, we have you know, Cabernet, one has some Merlot in it, but even though what's labeled Cabernet Sauvignon, there's some other grapes, especially in, in the Hess Select. So North Coast Aviate, both of these are tw- 2019 vintage. So if you're doing this type of comparison at home and you're trying to dig down to see, okay, what is the sense of place based off of a wine label, and production area, having the same vintage can be very helpful because you're taking out vintage variation. And this is why I selected 2019 for these two wines. Now, the North Coast, I should say, we're taking out vintage variation. Producer variation can vary. Oak usage, new oak versus old oak. But for both of these wines, similar to the Riesling, we're getting a sense of Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm-hmm. 
the black tea, a little bit of Earl Grey, English breakfast, red fruits, black fruits. Also getting some influence of oak, which is in the method of production for both of these wines. Certainly. But let's taste the North Coast. Let's do it. Delicious. Super delicious. Good tannin, confirming those berry notes. Now let's compare it to the Oak Knoll District. Which is Cabernet and Merlot. Which is Cabernet and Merlot. We don't know in what proportion, but... Right. And the first one is actually uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, a little Petit Syrah, and Malbec for the Hesselect. This one's lovely. Mm Mm-hmm. The oak intensity is a little bit more on the nose. It's a more elegant. It's kind of got us. The, the texture is different on, yeah. on the palate. It coats more. I, I, I want to say the tannin is not as gripping as the North Coast. But we think about Oak Knoll District is, is interesting because you have influence of the San Pablo Bay. You're at the southern part of Napa Valley. You have morning fog, which helps cool down the vineyards. But it is, stereotypically speaking, a, a right area. And we don't know the proportion of Cabernet Sauvignon or other grapes from the Hess Select that is sourced from cooler climates of Sonoma or even in Mendocino. What's the alcohol content of this? You know, that's a really good question. I see 13.5 for the Hess Select. This is 14.3. 14.3. So a little bit more. It's, you know, nothing too crazy. Nothing too crazy. I was thinking that it was a little crazier, but Mm -hmm. uh, I think the average person would be like, oh, you know, or Hi, even me. It's like, these are great wines. Both of them are wonderful to have at the table, to eat with food. Method of production changes a little bit. More oak on mm-hmm. the second one. A little bit riper fruit to it, which also can be in relation to the alcohol as well. What about the prices on these? Do you, re- do you recall what you spent on these? The Hess, I want to say, was 18. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, under 20. The other one's what? And the other's like 25. Okay. There you mm-hmm. go. Good to know. How much do those Rieslings run, Ballpark? Those are, uh, those are Rieslings, the right? Mosul was $19.99 and the Josef Hoffer was $26.99. Great. These two are lovely, the Californias. Let's go to South America, see if we can hit our next couple here. These are both Chilean wines. Tell us a little bit about big picture. What are, what are we dealing with in Chile as it relates to Appalachians, geographical indications and so on? What's the scene there? Well, it's it's so hard because historically speaking with Chilean wine, We just thought Chile and we didn't recognize or even fully understand all of these various growing areas, which, you know, similar to California, really can change if you're growing right along the Pacific Ocean. It's much cooler than if you're growing in the Central Valley or even in the Andes. And now as consumers are diving deeper into Chilean wines, but also People are label, you know, Chilean producers are labeling. They are celebrating much more a sense of place. And I think it's really exciting in the market. Don't be afraid to pick up and look at the back label. When you're at the store, yes, you'll see Chile maybe on the front, but really picking up and looking at the back label to see where it's from, because they'll say D.O. or Denominación de mm-hmm. Origen. And that is giving a sense of where the wine or where the grapes are from. What about Argentina? Argentina is doing some interesting things with their wine laws as well. They have geographic indications, which would be much larger areas. Mm -hmm. And then they have DOCs, which we, of course, associate with European labeling. DOCs have specific grapes that can be allowed to use, yields, alcohol levels, even aging. Some have aging characteristics. Good to know. So what are we digging into here? So we have here, and this is where picking up the back label is important. So our first one is the Conchi Toro. Casillo del Diablo. And on the front label, it's it says Reserva, Cabernet Sauvignon. And on the front label, it just says Chile. But then picking up on the back label, it says Central Valley or Val Central. And that is a very large growing area. So can we get a sense of place from there? That's arguable. You can argue either way. Yes, it's going to be different than if it was growing right on the coast, but like the Central Valley of California, there's a lot of climactic differences within it. You'll see this wine. This is around. This retails for about $9. Exactly. A lot of restaurants carry this. One of the reasons why I want to pick this is because it's a very friendly wine. I purchased it for $9.99. Today, it's juicy, Mm -hmm. fruity. We don't get an intense amount of oak on this wine, but also considering the price point, too. But then we're comparing it against the Echeveria, a limited, I think it's a limited edition. It is. 
Yep. And it's from the Maipo Valley. So Maipo Valley, just north of the Central Valley, it's a smaller area. So again, going back to that sense of place, both of these are, are Cabernet Sauvignon, but the intensity of the Echeveria is richer. It's striking. Yeah, yes, it is. But both of these wines are beautiful and there is a place at the table for each of them. If you want to dig deeper into the place, and this is where also looking at going back to producer always is the final note of quality. Maybe they have growing practices. Maybe they're organic. Maybe they're uh, biodynamic, something that you personally want to support in your with your dollar. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Very different wine. Mm hmm. Much more intense. Again, aromatically intense. The color is much richer. You're getting some spice notes, the oak, much more presence of mm -hmm. oak, very, very well integrated into the wine. Just looking at the color of these two. Yeah, just a lot, lot less fruit, peppery. Mm -hmm. Lovely. But that one still is, is $24.99. So you think about it's giving you more of a sense of place, but you're not breaking the bank. And that's where just looking at any of the wine labels, don't be afraid to pick up the back label. Mm -hmm. And I have to say there's sometimes I've done that too, where I look at the friend label and I'm like, where's this wine from? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, so much more information is on the back label and just educating yourself. Do you like, you know, if you really, really love Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley, do you like the mountain AVAs, Howell Mountain, Spring Mountain? because you like fruit that's grown at higher elevation. Well, if you like that, then you can also translate it to some of, in, in Chile, the higher elevation uh, vineyards there as well. Right, and this becomes part of what you call your wine journey, exactly. right? Exactly. You, you start to figure out your thing and it, it can go down to, you know, elevation side of the river. <laughs> and you, you, you can kind of start making yourself crazy. Cheryl is faculty author of several courses on wine and certificate programs offered through Cornell University. I know that there's a whole segment within your courses about reading the label and trying to make sense of that. Who's the winemaker? Where, where is that? The type of wine, the AOC information and all that kind of stuff. Yes. Every wine has to have a producer. Every mm -hmm. wine has to have the alcohol by volume. A wine does not have to have a vintage, though. If it's an AVA wine from the United States, then yes, it has to have a vintage. And this is where sometimes, depending on the classification of the wine, it might not list a vintage. So why not list a vintage? How does it happen? Tell us what's going on from the producer standpoint. From the producer standpoint, it could just be a basic, basic table wine and mm -hmm. they blend. There are some producers that do multiple vintage wines. For example, Cane is a great example and they have a multi-vintage blend that's just non-vintage. And this allows for just thinking about the practicality of it, consistency. Exactly. Well, okay. think about non-vintage champagne. So non-vintage champagne, you have the wine from the year and then you add the reserves. And there was a vintage champagne or not a vintage, a non-vintage champagne that I poured the other day that had 60 percent of reserve wine from previous years blended in. But that's just to create a house style. So if I buy it mm -hmm. today, if I buy it five years from now, it tastes the same. So we visited Germany. We checked out California and Chilean wines. Turns out China is emerging as a potential huge player in the short and long term. Yes, uh, there is some really, really interesting stuff going on in yeah. the Chinese wine market in the production uh, and high elevation, yeah. high, high elevation. In some parts of the country, they actually have to bury the vines in the wintertime or in monsoon season to protect them. But it's we are seeing some of the wines here in the United States and not that much. It's primarily for the Chinese market. But with those Chinese wines that are being produced, you have a lot of investment from large wine companies or beverage companies from around the world because they see the Chinese market as being large, but then also the export market as well. Yeah, the seventh largest in the world or fifth. It depends on the source yeah. and kind of where that comes from. OK, well, we'll be on the case when that starts to kind of happen. Right? Yes. When we see some Chinese wines on the shelves, Sarah, will do a tasting. Definitely. As far as today, thank you so much for coming in and, and talking about designations, appellations and indications. And thank you. And I just want to say one thing, Chris. What? Don't be afraid to take out your phone and Google. If you don't know a term or you think it's a place, but you're not quite sure, I have to admit I do it myself. I'm like, I don't know what that means. Oh, OK. Google it. But your local wine shop will be more than happy to inform you and sell you some, some cool stuff. Exactly. Thanks for listening to Cornell Keynotes. Check out the episode notes for information on those online certificate programs in wine appreciation from eCornell. Thanks again, friends, and stay in touch. Cheers.